Now we move on to transformation. An entrepreneur's job doesn't end after the early years. In fact, many would argue it never gets easier. Being an entrepreneur can be a very grueling life experience. To stay one step ahead of the competition, entrepreneurs need to continually adapt their business models and occasionally even disrupt themselves. Throughout the growth phase of their businesses, how do entrepreneurs remain agile without losing sight of their essence or mission? Our next session will hopefully surface a few answers. While most entrepreneurs understand the need for a compelling business plan, few understand the importance of developing a growth plan, or indeed, how growth can shape a company's performance as it evolves to respond to the market. In this session, we will explore growth through the lens of the innovative luxury e-tailer Moda Operandi and its leadership duo who are just embarking on a mission to break into the Chinese market. Please welcome Lauren Santo Domingo, co-founder and chief brand officer of Moda Operandi and Ganesh Srivats, chief executive officer of Moda Operandi. Hi guys. Um, all right. So. Lauren, I, I wanted to start with you, um, and before we jump into your China strategy, I think <laughs> it's important to, for, for especially for our, our community here in Shanghai who might not be familiar with the Moda Operandi business model and why it was so innovative when it was first uh, launched almost 10 years ago now. Um, can you talk to us about the original kind of elevator pitch proposition of Moda Operandi and how that business proposition has changed Got over it. the years? Um, so it hasn't changed much, but um, the idea is actually quite a traditional concept. The idea of a trunk show is a traditional um, a concept of basically shopping straight from the runway. So when I was a Vogue assistant, a junior editor at Vogue, um, I had great access to the runway, to the designer showrooms, and I would be sitting front rows in the show, and um, I realized there was a very big disconnect between the industry insiders and then the actual customers, the women who wanted to buy the clothes going down the runway. And often the clothes going down the runway were never produced or they were never picked up by a department store or a boutique, and so it became apparent to me that the two needed to meet. Okay. Um, and last year, after kind of 10 years of growth, raising, I think, almost $300 million. Almost. Almost $300 million, which is you know, a staggering amount of money. You lured away this gentleman <laughs> from uh, Elon Musk, yes. a, a legendary entrepreneur from the Silicon Valley. How do you convince someone to pick up, leave one of the most innovative companies one of the kind of most famous entrepreneurs in the world and kind of set up shop with you in New York to work on fashion. What was your pitch to him? Well, I think what we realize is that, uh, you know, the, the fashion industry is one of those industries where um, to be successful, you sort of have to be this heritage brand, a luxury heritage brand. And with that comes a lot of preconceived notions and also sometimes an old fashioned mentality. And um, even I myself am, am a, a bit prone to, to follow the rules, especially those rules of fashion. So. What was great about Ganesh is that he came with this idea coming from, from Elon, who basically started an automotive company, but never hired anyone from an automotive company, no one from Chrysler, no one from GM, because they're bringing with them these preconceived notions. Sure. So for me, when I was looking for someone, needed someone, I mean, even if you just go through the filter, right, of, of, of who do we need to scale this business, we need someone in tech, we need someone in fashion, and we need someone who's scaled a business. And when you search that down, there's only one person, and that's him. <laughs> All right. so. Well, that's a good endorsement. So Ganesh, let me flip the question around a bit. What was it that appealed to you about this opportunity? Because you know, you were, it's not like you were in a, in a place that wasn't exciting or interesting. <laughs> why, why Moda Operandi, and why now? Yeah. I, I what people may not know about my background is that, is that I actually grew up in fashion. I spent a decade at Burberry, uh, which in its time was considered one of the digital pioneers, but I did get the bug to go work in tech because I wanted to be in a more disruptive environment, and I, was, I felt like luxury in fashion wasn't innovating fast enough. 
right? So I left the industry, I went away, and had this phenomenal experience in the Valley. <clears throat> when, I, when I bumped into Lauren, or in Lauren <laughs> and I met, uh, what, I, what really appealed to me about Moda is kind of combining the two things that I love, which is fashion and a disruptive tech environment, right? And for me, once I realized that that would be possible by becoming part of Moda, it became a bit of a no-brainer because I, I moved back to New York and I took up this opportunity. And so, um, so yeah, and I'm really excited and, uh, um, to actually be, to be back in fashion, but, but to have a chance to change the industry from the inside, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. okay, so now we're gonna get down to business. Because if you're gonna, you're gonna scale this business, yeah. uh, and you've you know, set uh, kind of some pretty lofty ambitions with the amount of money that's been raised for this company. You know, as most CEOs, when they first join, they have kind of a 90-day plan, or the first 180 days. I think you're just finishing kind of your first six months or so. Yeah. What have been your priorities since you've joined? Like, what's the business strategy? What are you looking to do with this company now? Yeah, first thing I should say is that my onboarding is still not complete. Okay. <laughs> okay, so it turns out you can miss a lot in a few years. And, and also, I think like any maybe driven executive, and I'm certainly like that, when, when I come into a new opportunity, I, I want to start fixing things and changing things and building things from day one, right? But actually, things don't work that way in that organizations have their own alchemy, right? They have their own sort of uh, chemistry of, the culture, the people, and the history that has taken the company from wherever it started to what it is today. And I think um, as much as I came in with a lot of energy to sort of quickly change and transform things, I had to sort of hunker down a little bit and learn a lot. Why uh, does this model work? Why does the customer like to shop this way? And all the skepticism that an, only an outsider can bring. And also questioning things like, like the why, right? And like Lauren says, sometimes we just end up doing things out of repetition. And when you sort of step back and say, why does it work, you, you may actually have some interesting answers. And so it's been, uh, for the first six to seven months for, for me has really been about learning, about our customer, about our business, about our business model. The second thing is the team, right? The priority is always people. And w once we, we knew that we had to move the company in a new direction to scale, nothing wrong with Moda, the, a great product connecting with a, a fashion consumer, but to scale, you need technology. You need data, right? You need digital development. And so we quickly started bringing in a lot of great talent uh, in the technology area, in operations, uh, in, other, uh, in other parts. And you've seen some of the announcements that we've made in hiring. Uh, before you have a business strategy, go hire a lot of smart people <laughs> because they'll tell you what to do, right? Like, and so that was really a big part of my focus. And I probably spent 70 or 80% of my time interviewing for the first six months, right? Just bringing a lot of smart people in. And, and, and along the way, a hazy picture starts forming as well about like, what we're going to do with the company. And it's, frankly, it turns out after six months of intense research, we want to really double down on what we already do. Right? And, and I think not having to make any major pivots uh, is important. It's like, because it wasn't coming in saying, how do we fix Moda? It was about how do we grow Moda? And, and growth uh, comes from first understanding the core and saying, how do you amplify that core business? And so our, our business strategy will be very much rooted in amplifying this business model that Lauren just described of connecting designers directly to consumers. How do we make that a richer experience for the consumer? How do we add more value to the designer community as we scale? And how do we use data and technology to make both sides work much more efficiently uh, as we grow the company? So that's sort of the overarching goal of the company, uh, and obviously the details we'll fill in along the way, right? right. Well, I want to fill in some details right now, because <laughs> I mean, that's, not, that's not enough depth for me. I mean, when, when the Moda Operandi business was first created, one of the things, um, there were two things that really stood out to me about the business model. The first was around um, the lack of investment required in purchasing inventory in advance, right? So like the problem with a lot of e-commerce businesses, of course, is they have to, or you know, traditional retail businesses, frankly, is that they have to buy inventory. They don't exactly know what people are gonna buy. Um, they put it out there, hope that their buyers have kind of found the right things. Yeah. But importantly, they also have to pay for all that stuff. So they, t they take an inventory risk. Moda Operandi was a different business because um, People were placing orders up front, and therefore your choices of what to buy were, were literally informed by what people actually wanted. So that's part one. Yeah. And then part two was, uh, it wasn't just about you know, giving people what they wanted. It was uh, taking that data at the aggregate level and saying, okay, what can we learn from this data? 
and how, who and how th could this data be valuable? Mm -hmm. So I see a twinkle in your eyes, Ganesh, because the, how do those two things drive your strategy going forward? If you're doubling down on what Moda always did, you know, what's your plan for taking that element of the, of the business model and, and, and scaling it? Well, I'm smiling because you did a pretty terrific <laughs> job explaining our strategy, so at least it's kind of resonating. You know, um, as far as uh, the pre-order trunk show business is concerned, I think you said it right, right? Like, if you think about the fundamental fulcrum on which the fashion industry has to pivot, it's inventory. What do we buy? How do we sell it? And I think that's sort of the age-old problem. And you, people have come at it in a lot of different ways. You know, you can build better and more beautiful stores and have the best personal shoppers and, and, and all visual merchandising and all kinds of stuff. But ultimately, it's inventory. You got to figure out how to sell it, right? And then more and more, as we see competition intensifying in fashion, discounts, markdowns, promotions, right, have become so normalized now, and the idea of selling full price ready-to-wear fashion is almost becoming quaint. And I think that's what is interesting, was interesting to me about Moda is that going right to the heart of the core problem in fashion where most of, I mean, I don't want to make broad generalizations, but I guess I will, which is like, you know, so much of the growth has come from accessories, right? Because ready-to-wear is something people shy away from. 75% of Moda's business is fashion ready to wear, luxury ready to wear, right? And I, th I love that because uh, there are designers in this audience who put out collections twice, three, four times a year. You want those clothes to be sold. You want people wearing those clothes. You don't want a buyer to tell you, hey, you know what, beautiful clothes, but I can't really sell it. Or I, I could sell it, but not enough to make it worth my while. And so because inventory was the core issue, buyers become the arbiters of what is and isn't uh, a product that should go to market. It's not the designer and it's not the consumer because the consumers don't even get to vote. At least the designers can have a conversation about it. And so I think this is about putting power back in the hands of consumers and designers, right? Let them have that dialogue with each other. Let, the, let there be customers who want to pick items that maybe you and I don't think are commercial, but maybe for them, that's what they want to wear. And I think if you look at what's happening in the world, Technology is making things possible that wasn't previously possible, but allowing taste to get individualized, right? To get taste to be personalized, where I don't have to go to Spotify and only listen to the hits. I can listen to any old esoteric song from you know, a language that I don't even understand, and that's my business, right? And so I think that's what is really uh, interesting about the mode, and I think that it's ultimately any great business has to be uh, rooted in a philosophical movement, right? And that movement right now is consumer choice. Uh, power in the hands of consumers and creators. And how do we, you know, so we think if we can anchor ourselves there, that's going to be immense. The second thing you mentioned, though, is that to the extent that we've managed to cultivate a core audience that is willing to come four or five months earlier than a collection is even going to be in any store and give us their vote in the, ha in the manner of their deposits, then we are able to collect that data and we're able to forecast and predict in much better terms what is going to be successful in fashion four to six months from now. And, as, and I saw enough data after coming into Moda that the, the, the power of prediction, the power of forecasting in Moda is immense. And that's going to be our second advantage because if we could, if, you know, people always say, if only I had a crystal ball. Well, it turns out we do have a crystal ball, right? And we want to share Maybe the crystal Maybe that should be your Chinese name. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about the need for having a Chinese uh, name of Moda, but maybe it's crystal ball. Yeah. And, so uh, tell me that. You know, and take the crystal ball and hand it back to the designers. Yeah. Because designers are having to make uh, business decisions you know, every day about how, what do I produce, how much do I produce. Because to a young designer to, be, to go and become a, a business person, it's, uh, it's unnerving. It's expensive. So will you sell right? them that data or you'll just give it to them? Uh, you know, I think our, ultimately we want to add value into the ecosystem and, uh, and make sure that the entire industry can be more efficient and successful and sustainable. And so for us, it's not about am I going to build you or not. It's about forming a symbiotic relationship with the designer where they build their business on the Moda platform and we, we share the full value of the platform with them. Okay. So we don't want them to see us as some sort of a, just as a vendor relationship, but rather a platform on which they can build their business. Got it. Okay. So in the world of scaling companies using technology and data, our industry is still a brand-driven industry. Mm -hmm. And Ro uh, Lauren, you're... Your role as chief brand officer and really like being connected to the consumer in a way becomes even more important because I think as much as data and technology can help us in fashion, we can never lose sight of that intangible thing that makes fashion special. So if he's the kind of left brain, <laughs> data, tech, business, 
what are you going to be doing on the right brain side of Moda to keep, to keep that kind of connection, the emotional connection with the consumer? The thing that I realize about women as I travel around and, and especially listening to the, to, the, to the previous panelists as we talk about uniqueness and, and you know, we're breaking customers down into segments and generation and that's great. But when I travel around the world and I interact with women, um, we all have the same drives, the same fears, the same hopes. Um, we all love fashion for, for pretty much the same reason. And um, usually the only thing that changes is the weather, where you live, and the way you interact with technology. So what you were saying before about WeChat, I mean, in the US, we don't even use WhatsApp. So the idea that as an American company, we're going to uh, be dictating how a woman is interacting with, with, with fashion on technology, um, it's something that we're looking to start here and to, to look at the way that women are actually interacting. But the hopes and dreams and the core, the core you know, belief system of a woman is the same wherever she is. Okay. Y you mentioned the, the China opportunity, and obviously that's one of the reasons you both are here this week and your teams are here. It's like immersing yourself in this market. We heard what Andrew said about the opportunity here, growing the GDP of Australia every year. <laughs> Can you give us a sense of your kind of early thoughts on what this, op this market might present as an opportunity for Moda Operandi? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the statistics and numbers are all out there and Andrew spoke about it so eloquently but I almost think that could be the sort of dangerous thing in that we all get invested in this idea of China as a major cash cow and how quickly can we come out here and squeeze that all out. And that's really, I think we have made a very early decision that China is central to the company's future and, and we need to come in here and become part of the local fabric, right? Become locals here and, and really understand this country from the inside out. And so we made some broad principles rather than strategies so far. And the first principle is we don't have an Asia Pacific strategy. We don't have a greater China strategy. We have a mainland China strategy, right? Which is how do we really come to this country and take it for what it is versus having a team in Hong Kong that happens to dabble a little bit in Korea, Japan, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong. And, 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 and so first and foremost, is it's about China. And, to, and therefore to pursue that strategy, we are setting up our headquarters in Shanghai and we're hiring an entire China team in Shanghai, including, you know, uh, from leadership onwards. And so how do we have a local team? That's number two. And number three is fully empowering and trusting that team. I think the, I understand the reticence and uh, fear of Western companies to come into a foreign market and say, hey, you know, it's our brand and it's our platform. But I come from, I come from India. And so we, obviously, I, I see the other side, which is, hey, you can trust us. You know, and I think it's interesting to me that you would have a country that represents a third of global luxury sales, but we don't maybe trust them with their, the, the people here to understand how to build brands locally. You know? And so I think the Chinese consumer and the, and the people I meet here are so sophisticated. It's how do we actually give them the tools we have, which I have a catalog of brands and I have the Moda name, but how, how to build a company in China will be about the local team strategy. And then the fourth thing we're doing is we're building a product that is completely ground up. You, the, the global app or the global website that you see from Moda will not be the Chinese. It's, we're not going to create a Chinese version of that. We're going to build something here from the ground up that really takes all the learnings from the really in, in, uh, interesting technology companies here uh, that we're all, we all talk about and say what are they doing best and how can we learn from them and build a product here that's really suitable for the Chinese market. And so those are the four sort of big principles for us right now that we're really excited about. And, and, and sort of let the chips fall where they fall, right? Because again, if we want to really be here, we have to embrace it uh, uh, like locals. And, and I'm, I've really told all my leadership team from New York, like they don't get to dictate to the Chinese market what we're going to do over here. They get to enable and support and offer any advice and help they can, but on the demand of the Chinese market, not, on, not pushing it at them. Sure. Um, clearly, part of your strategy must involve mobile first thinking, right? So. And everything here seems to work, as I was saying earlier, on, on the WeChat platform. But there's also a decision to be made, because you know, building something within WeChat, you have the platform, but you have some limitations, whereas building your own app, say, yeah. might give you more flexibility, but then you need to get people to download, engage with that app. How are you 
thinking about that decision? Uh, um, I don't think it's an either or uh, decision. I think it's a sequencing. Okay. You know, so how do we bring a product to market? When I say product, I mean our platform, the Moda product, right, uh, to market in China that's quick and allows us to engage with the local audience that we can start learning. Perhaps WeChat is that platform. But then over time, how do we have a, a, a native experience that is fully custom built? And that takes time. Yeah. And so part of it is being able to get, to get a product to market with some speed and agility. Look, short term, we're also selling products directly from our US side into China. We're not stopping that either. So it's not an either or strategy. It's a little bit of uh, sequencing and prioritization. And, and as you go along, you learn, you adapt, and you scale further, right? And it's sort of like that, that, that process that rather than looking for a big, quick win, uh, how do we look three, five years out and then make sure that we're putting the right foundations in place that allows us to scale sustainably and ho over time, hopefully, achieve all of our ambitions, right? So, um, and so if that means we have to wait on the app or do something different, I don't know, we haven't decided yet, but we'll sort of have to take those technology decisions as they come. One of the things that Moda did a few years in after the trunk show model really started to take off is interestingly, you also started doing kind of traditional retail where you were buying inventory, maybe informed by the data you had. Um, to what extent is that part of the strategy going forward, both internationally and here in China? I have to say it's, it's, a, it's a central part of our strategy because it's sort of like having a crystal ball and saying, but I don't ever want to look at it. <laughs> like, why would you do that, right? I want to know what's the future. And so um, I, th uh, I think that we have an opportunity to double down on, triple down on it because as much as Moda has had access to it, I think the honest to God truth is I don't know that we've fully utilized it as well as we could have. And uh, even since I've come in, we've made further investments with the data that have paid real dividends and I think what is going to be really exciting is, look, some of the things that we know in the Chinese environment um, is the importation and taxes and duties and, hey, how do you bring goods in? How do you take them out when customers want to return something? These are logistical problems that all of us face. It's not that Moda can have a solve that you know, is not shared. But with the data, we can know what the Chinese consumer wants or what Shanghai consumers want versus Beijing consumers want and forward position inventory that is really relevant to the market gives you the best chance of actually selling versus buying it and hoping for the best, right? Mm -hmm. And so that would be a competitive advantage, in my opinion, because that way we're reducing the cost of unsold inventory or returns and so forth, which, honestly, I think is probably one of the biggest detriments for cross-border luxury uh, retail companies to come to China. Yeah. That's a really interesting point. I guess I wonder um, to what extent you guys already have data or experience to say that actually your data is the crystal ball? Can you give us a sense of, you know, in the early years when, when, you, were, um, when you were placing these orders based on the data, I mean, did it work? Well, it's interesting what, what, what Ganesh was saying is that we actually had the crystal ball but didn't necessarily have the, the ability to mine that data. But we can look at now, even just in the last seven months that he's been here, is seeing these great strides in, in mining this data, is that we know now from when a collection goes down the runway, whether it's New York, London, Paris, or Milan, within seven minutes of that collection going down the runway, we know what are the standout colors, styles, shapes, silhouettes, sizes, and regions that those looks are going to. I think you should change the name of the company to Crystal Ball. <laughs> I really believe that. Okay, one last question, which is a kind of a necessary question. You've raised $300 million. You have all of these investors, <laughs> right? They're looking for an exit. You're one of the last few players in the space of, of scale that rem remains independent. You know, Farfetch is IPO, you know, Netaporte sold merged with Ukes, bought by Richemont. My <laughs> My Teresa has been snapped up by Neiman Marcus. What's the exit plan? Look, uh, uh, I mean, I've just come in, right? So <laughs> I think the board is looking at me like, yeah, dude, what is the exit plan? Yeah. Now, um, you know, I, I think Lauren would say this because I, I, Lauren has been there since the beginning. And credit to her, like the, the quality of investors that she's put around Moda are bar none. We have an exceptional group of investors and a fantastic board. And I'm not just saying that because they're watching and they pay my bills, you know. And in the, uh, and in, in the last round, actually, which was very much a growth round, right, uh, Moda raised 70% of its entire cap in the last round. That's a huge 
would have cost like 150 million. 165 million yeah. out of a total 290 million raise. And, uh, and you know, it was all in the last round. And there was a big vote of confidence on the part of investors. A big part of that was about global expansion, especially China. And in fact, in the last round, one of the lead investors was Adrian Chang, who is a Hong Kong based investor, you know, owns the K11 malls and many other Chow Thai folk, et cetera. And with the expressed desire of wanting to be a partner for us as we wanted to come into China, Hong Kong, of course, and also China. And so we having him and his company back us. And so it was a, it was a very exciting round. And so now it's about, uh, we have to do the hard work now of delivering on that growth over the next three to five years. And along the way, uh, you know, when the board and everyone feels like it's an appropriate time, uh, you know, everything will be on the table. But I think at this point, we feel like we're just in the beginning of the growth story. And it's too early for us to talk about an exit because, yeah, if anything, the whole team was excited about diving into all these challenges and really growing this and scaling the business. I mean, so. we started nine, nine years ago. And I mean, my original plan was to maybe <laughs> at year five, you know, thought we'd be, you know, bought by Neiman Marcus or something like that. And then it was probably a few years ago when we we're sitting around the board and uh, one of the investors says, you know, Neiman Marcus is for sale. Would you like to buy them? <laughs> right. That's how the world has changed. And that's when I realized, okay, we're on a totally different trajectory now. Okay. Well, I look forward to looking into that crystal ball. Yeah. One day I hope I can come and look at some of your data because I Absolutely. think it will be really interesting. Thank you for sharing your personal and professional journeys. I'm really excited to see what you guys get up to. And please join me in thanking Lauren and Ganesh. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Bye. Thank you. Bye.